Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this edition of our midday magazine program, Press R. Today, we will also talk about the bilingualism law, which uh, the Commission on Bilingualism and Multiculturalism is promoting and wanting all of us, you and me, uh, to be bilingual and to use both languages wherever we are so as to give Cameroon that true nature of a bilingual country. We have uh, uh, <coughs> Mr. George Ngwane, you're welcome. Thank you. Member of the National Commission on Bilingualism and Multiculturalism. Uh, Mr. George Ngwane, you are a member of the National Commission on Bilingualism and Multiculturalism, but we've noticed um, an aggressive approach of late in trying to sensitize people about the usage of both languages. Why now and why that aggressive approach? Right, thank you, Joe. Um, first of all, I, it's important to say this is the first time uh, our country is having um, a lot of languages. Um, and also just in two and a half years of existence, the International Commission on the Promotion of Bilingualism is also associated with the law on bilingualism. Mm -hmm. um, we know that for a long time there has been um, concerns, especially by users uh, of the minority language community, which we normally call Anglophone, who have been um, sometimes aggrieved by the fact that they are not well treated at the level of um, language communication. Uh, so this time we thought that after such a language law has been enacted already, it will be important for the people who are going to be our target audience, uh, which Cameroonians, to be able to claim ownership first of that um, language law and also to be able to appreciate what the content of that language law is all about. Mm -hmm. We are going on the field with modesty and humility to get uh, some of the contentious areas that um, had already been indicated in the law and be able to explain to them exactly how we can circumvent them as language commissioners that we are. Okay. And um, we, uh, we know, we can recall, that before this, uh, the law came to Parliament as a bill, you went round the country to talk to people of mm. and especially in the Northwest, and got uh, the preoccupations of the people. Was that reflected in the final draft and the law which you are promoting today? You can be sure that when it comes to a law, not everything on the ground will be reflected in that law. And that's why we always say the law is never static. We give room in a law for it to have lots of revisions and amendments. But I think the bulk of it, 30 sections of the law, we can find about two sections, um, 19 and 26, which are, came under the scanner in terms of how they are going to be applied, especially again in the Anglophone areas. But that was taken care of in rephrasing them before they came out as law. And I want to explain this especially to the public. Section 19 actually talks of how official correspondences can be done in English and French. And this now can be interpreted in two areas. Inference. The first inference we have is that Anglophones will be asking, are we sure we're not going to be having documents again in French? Something which the Anglophone lawyers actually stood against. That could be taken care of in terms of another language communication interpretation, which says that the principle of proportionality says that the communication, the language of communication you use in an area should be proportionate to the population that is that, listening to you. That is listening to you. And that is clear, except that that population also has 5% of the other language. So in case of, a, like the case of um, the Southwest, Northwest, you can be sure that it will be difficult for you to find most of the correspondences in French. Secondly, there is a principle of specificity. We just came out now talking about a special status. And part of the special status has to do with history and linguistic specificity. So you can be sure that that could be taken care of. As for section 26, that says that um, <coughs> English and French can be used indiscriminately, mm -hmm. especially in our, in our courts. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of contention. But let us say there's another principle called the principle of active offer. People have read section 26, subsection 1, without going to subsection 2, which says that the litigant has a right, or it is his language of choice, that should be used in court. Therefore, people have to listen first to the litigant and be sure that he is either English-speaking or French-speaking before uh, uh, the court uh, proceedings can be done. Secondly, there is now a need, especially in the legal context, for most magistrates and legal professionals to be bilingual. And this is taken care of by Section 12 of that law saying that people have to be trained, as, as well as Section 6. People have to be trained in their various uh, public entities. 
And this is not the first time I'm hearing about people being trained. If you look at the Official Languages Act of Canada, it makes clear that they have a public service official language appointment regulation, which says that before you do anything in the public service, at a certain level, you must have a bilingual mastery. It is called the other imperative or non-imperative appointment. So it comes to a point where we should be able to have magistrates and across the field. Do you have that in the law? It's not in the law, but it's in inherent in the law by saying that people are going to be trained. Thirdly, if all Cameroonians were to be bilingual, I'm sure translators and interpreters will not have any job. And you know that that's the case we have in most of the courts today, that we have simultaneous interpretation when it comes to rendering decisions in either English or French. But should it be that uh, that is the law that prescribes that the, the languages should be used, or that you assume that because you are bilingual, I would choose the language to use on you? No, when it comes to Section 26, again, I said that the language um, depends on the litigant. And again, I think there's been so much talk about the court, and uh, it's understandable that all of these arose from Anglophone lawyers. The same thing goes for the health sector. I have seen cases where medical professionals are writing prescriptions in, the, in a language that the patient does not know. We've seen cases where most of the schools of instruction especially in Anglophone areas, are done in a language that is far from being English. So it is, it is the, the one in court is actually, I'll call it the more specific term, but in terms of global term, we are saying that everyone, and that's when we look at the law on bilingualism, between sections 5 to section 12, you'll find that everything is user-centered and everything is citizen-friendly. Okay. In other words, yes. Yes, the way you put it uh, makes me feel that uh, almost everything uh, that was asked for or which you wanted to happen, happened. Let me turn to the, to the lawyer uh, who has a more critical eye on that uh, to say, uh, would you say that the law on bilingualism is revolutionary and again that one of the uh, pushing the factors sense. that led us to having this was the strike which you, the, the lawyers initiated. Now, would you agree with what he's saying that at least at this point in time, your aspirations have been met? Oh, uh, Joe, um, I was here on this set uh, when the law was um, sent, to parliament. Today, sent to parliament yes. and we, we talked on it elaborately. And um, I, I had my reservations at that time and, and the, the law uh, was voted. There is a very important um, provision that he talked about, the provision that gives the uh, litigant the opportunity to make the choice of uh, his language that he wants to be, uh, to, to, to be used in course of his prosecution. Uh, it's a very important uh, provision of the law. I think that um, I will not longer get into um, criticizing it. Uh, it. The law is there. Uh, let us see how uh, it, it works out. Will, will, will help us or <coughs> how, how it turns out uh, in the long run. But I think that um, the, the, all of it boils down to the vision of, of uh, the government and, and, and the people of Cameroon to see a, a more um, bilingual society. Then let us see what the future... Uh, now, uh, uh, the, 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 is there any section in the law which uh, obliges people and which uh, would force you to use both languages or be punished if you don't? No, let, me, let me answer that. Yes. The, in the law, you don't find a, a kind of... Um, sanction. A, a, a sanction. sanction. Mm -hmm. a, 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 there's no sanction in the law, but uh, as a lawyer, I will refer you to the penal code. The penal code, you look at a section that talks about... Um, a public um, servant that if you refuse to serve somebody uh, on the language through the language he best understands you, you, you could be prosecuted based on the provision of the penal code that talks about a refusal of a, a service due by a public uh, a functionary or public servant you see so it is that as that that section of the penal code may I can use as as, as, as a um, sanction for, for not respecting mm. uh, uh, that But that wouldn't, it, wouldn't, wouldn't it have been more appropriate to follow that up? Because it looks like it is at the beck and call of 
whoever the authority that is. Let me say here that, and I agree uh, completely with our legal expert, I have read close to 12 language laws in, this, in, the, in, 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 uh, in the world, and none of them has a sanction. That's why if you look at this our particular language law, it uses words like encourage, ensure, promote. But if you look at section 6, it tells you that you are bound, the citizen is bound to have his um, language of choice respected. But when you go to section 27, it tells you that the government is monitoring and evaluating through an advisory body the implementation of that law. And if that advisory body happens to be the National Commission for the Promotion of Bilingualism, then we have already two conduits that we can use. The first one is that we have a complaint section where you can use the toll-free number 1580 to send information that you are not being fairly treated. The second thing is that we carry out an investigation of what is going on. So the third thing has to do with what sanctions can be meted. The sanctions, again, go back to what the legal expert has said, but most especially, since our reports <coughs> go to the President of the Republic, you can be sure that the sanctions will be heavier than you imagine. Okay. Um, are you people gearing at a 50-50 percent type of parity when it comes to the usage of the language or that uh, for public uh, officials, for example, if you're making a speech, the speech must be 50-50 or that they must be French or English in that is the usage of both language irrespective of the percentage used. Uh, you're referring to section, section 16 of that law which talks about code switching. You're referring to code switching. Um, <clears throat> in official speeches, it is encouraged that you do code switching. And I'm so happy that most of the ministers today actually have engaged in that. I'll tell you something, Joe, a personal anecdote. No, in does March, it suffice it, to use the language or is it supposed to be 50-50? Uh, it, it all depends, first of all, on the audience that you have in front of you. I talked about the le level of proportionality. But the ideal would be to have a 50-50 percentage. Because in a case like Wales, Wales does everything 50-50. Canadians do it 50-50. I mean, oral or written. But in our case, that we are actually in a gestation period of bilingualism in terms of its implementation, you can be sure that there will be flexibility in terms of the percentage that is going to be used. But section 16 makes it very clear, subsection 2 makes it clear that you can use the language, the two languages alternately. Okay. Well, uh, can I, yes, I, think, uh, I was coming to you. Yeah, I, I read through uh, what is supposed to be the revised uh, uh, version. No, version. No, that's the first time it's being promulgated, so well, it's not revised. <laughs> I, I appreciate it quite well, but I have a problem at the level of implementation. Mm -hmm. First, when you look at the billboards on our mm -hmm. towns and cities, first of all, I think the, the commission is doing a, a quite a good job, but I have a feeling that there are people who don't understand English, for instance, but who take upon themselves to want to write Things in English and the language, the, the language we see sometimes are very embarrassing. I don't know what the, maybe we need to talk to him later to get what the commission is doing to correct those kind of errors. A translation? Are you talking about yes, translation on billboards? They are horrible. Or name name yeah. tags. And, and then whatever. secondly, the, the our own bilingualism, the way it is practiced in Cameroon here, it is that for instance, a minister can have his speech all of it in French. Mm -hmm. He reads it out in French, irrespective of the audience. At the end of it, they will pull out the English version and, it. and give out. I think that's not what we are aiming at. That is what used to happen before, and we are hoping that with this new law, we will be able to correct. And I agree with you. These are things that have been raised very genuinely and legitimately. So this is all taken care of in this new law, and I'm sure that if we have a bit of bit of an open-mindedness, we're able to be. To, to, especially as with, with regard to translation, I really have a beef with the fact that translations are poorly done. And the paradox is that Cameroon has about the best translators and interpreters. If you go most most of the continental uh, bodies, you will find them there. So what is the problem in Cameroon? It's possible that they are not functionally empowered. It is possible that every amateur comes up and thinks that because he has a minimum knowledge of English and French, he can be called. It might be a matter of patronage. My brother, come and take this small thing and do something for me. Exactly. It could be all of that. Mm -hmm. But with this new law, all of that kind of amateur work is actually going to be something in the past. Okay.